This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. We are the paradoxical eight. Bipedal, naked, large-brained, long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves, aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. So I've been spending some time working on this uh, question about the role of climate change in, in early human evolution. And I think the best way to frame it is that our, our best understanding of this problem is really it's this relationship between climate and life. That is, how has climate shaped life and how has life shaped climate? And I think the best way to convince ourselves that this is something that's in our blood, in our, in our entire world, is to look at a seasonal map of primary productivity in the oceans and on land uh, over, uh, over a multiple, uh, multiple year uh, period. And you can see the waxing and the waning of growth on the planet following the seasons. The planet literally breathes with life that's paced by just the tilt of our Earth with respect to the plane of, the, of its orbit around the sun. Also, if we take the longest possible perspective, we also find that climate shapes life. Each of the five major mass extinctions in life on Earth over the last 500 plus million years each of those five is, uh, is, has uh, been associated with a change in the environment. And so up to, and, and each one of these red lines here is, are where these mass extinctions occur, where somewhere between 50 and 90% of all species that were alive at the time became extinct. There are some have argued that there should be another red line uh, uh, there for today. So the last extinction was the extinction of the dinosaurs, and that paved the way for the rise of mammals. And today, I'm going to be talking about this last little sliver of time that includes our, our history. <clears throat> so if we look at this, this history of human evolution, this is a greatly simplified diagram of the human phylogeny or the family tree. And you can basically see these sort of red, yellow, and green sections. The human family tree has sometimes been likened to a, a Y-shaped pattern or a, or a more bushy one if you're more of a, of a, of a um, uh, not, not so much of a lumper. And so we move from uh, a, a, a single, very long-lived lineage of Australopithecines up until about somewhere around three million years ago, where the family tree takes a branch. One lineage, the yellow, which is sometimes referred to as, the, as Paranthropus, they're sort of the linebackers of the human family tree. They ultimately were not successful. And then the blue lineage, which is our own, that's the genus Homo. And so it's been described, actually Rick Potts and I were uh, part of a National Research Council um, committee to evaluate these times of, of human evolution, these main times of human evolution. And it appeared there are two main periods where there's a lot of action going on, focused intervals of time. 
These include this time interval from about 3 million to about 2.6 million years ago, when there are at least several things that are happening at this time, the extinction of, of, of um, Australopithecus afarensis, otherwise known as Lucy, um, also the appearance of these two new lineages, our genus Homo and the genus Paranthropus, and then this is also when the first stone tools appear, sometime around 3 million years ago. Then another event occurs sometime just after 2 million years ago, where we see uh, the appearance of, um, or the extinction of early Homo, the emergence of Homo erectus, um, the first time we start seeing the Acheulean toolkit, which is a much more sophisticated toolkit uh, that uh, would become the, the model for future stone tools. And then this is also the first out of Africa. This is the first time our um, ancestors left the African continent. It was about 1.8 million years ago. So the point of my discussion today is to ask this question, if climate is shaping life, did it also shape human origins? And the, the question here really is not so much just asking this question, did climate shape life, did it shape uh, human evolution? But really we have to ask the, the primary question, which is how did African climate change? And that turns out to be a really challenging problem for a number of very reasonable reasons. And so I'll, I'll let you know that um, the aim of this talk is really to uh, illuminate these uh, two main ways that African climate has changed in the past. One is that there have been these very regular pendulum swings, if you will, very rapid in geologic time, roughly every 20,000 years, where African climate oscillated between wetter and drier conditions, and it's been like a pacemaker throughout millions and millions of years. The other thing that's happened, superimposed on these wet-dry cycles, is this long-term shift toward more open, arid conditions. So if you allow your mind's eye to envision East Africa right now, you're probably thinking about the Serengeti or these open fields uh, of, of grasses. That uh, ecosystem is actually a geologically very recent phenomenon, only a, a couple of million years old. So when we look at the past African climate change, we see that um, variations in the strength of the African monsoon have been paced by variations in orbital precession. This is basically that the Earth has a wobble, uh, wobble in its orbit. Our northern hemisphere, um, the, 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 our star Polaris right now, uh, the, the orbiting star uh, 10,000 years ago was actually the star Vega, which is about 47 and a half degrees off in the other direction. The Earth sweeps out, the Earth's rotation actually sweeps out a cone in the celestial sphere on a 20,000 year beat. What that does on Earth is it changes the seasonal distribution of sunlight such that over Africa, the Northern Hemisphere summers would have been about 7% more sunlight and the winters would have had exactly the amount less. What this means for Africa is that it strengthens, it invigorates the African monsoon with this 20,000 year beat. It acts really like a, like a volume knob on the strength of the, of the monsoon. So these intervals in green that are shown here would be times of what we call an African humid period, a time when it would have been wetter um, in, the, in the past. And you'll see that they would have been paced at this 20 year beat throughout this time period. Now we know this is actually true, so this is actually predicted from theory. And what's amazing, and this is one of the reasons why I work in this field, is that when we actually look at the geologic record for this, it shows that there were these wet periods in the time. And this is actually from a sediment core in the uh, eastern Mediterranean where a, a sediment core was drilled in this location. And this is a 10 meter core. This is one and a half meters, and then it connects with the top up there. The base of this connects to the top of there and so on. You can see that it has these black and white layers. The black layers are these organic rich sediments that accumulated when the Nile River outflow is much, much greater than today. And so that made for anoxic or low oxygen conditions in the bottom of the Mediterranean so just like if you turn off the bubbler on your fish tank, all the fish die and the organic matter goes to the bottom, that's what happened during each one of these events. And it happens not only for this time period here, representing maybe 200,000 years of time, but actually for millions of years. This is actually a record, this is actually an outcrop that we see in Sicily. It's actually a shot from a bar in Sicily. And these are actually people, these are actually people working on this outcrop. You can barely see it, that little red dot. And each of these dark layers is one of these sapropel units. And you can see how they're bundled into groups of four and five, which is this eccentricity modulation of these processional cycles. Each one of these dark layers would be at 20,000 years apart. This represents one million years of time going back 10 million years ago. So this has just been a heartbeat of African climate change going on for millions and millions of years, unbroken. So if we look at Lake Turkana, for example, Lake Turkana in northern Kenya is nestled in a desert environment today, but if you go to the shores of Lake Turkana, you'll see these bathtub rings where Lake Turkana was 50 meters or 150 feet higher than it is today during one of these wet phases 10,000 years ago. 
That's just one of these little bars at the very top. And you can see there have been just hundreds of these in the past. So African climate has been nothing but continuously varying between wet and dry and wet and dry. So we look at the grassland expansion. This is the second way that African climate has changed over the time scale of early human evolution. And again, I show you this image of these grasslands from East Africa. These actually cover something between 80 and 90% of the Af East African landscape today. And this, this envision of, let's say, of the Serengeti, this vision that we all have of East Africa is actually a very recent geological development. It's only about um, two to three million years old. What's interesting about these savanna grasslands is that they represent a very specific ecological adaptation to a very specific environment. That environment is hot, dry, very seasonal rainfall, and low carbon dioxide. In fact, the uh, photosynthetic pathway, that's, this is called C4 because it represents um, it's a four carbon compound that's developed through photosynthesis versus a three carbon compound. The C4 um, molecules, or the C4 uh, photosynthesis, is adapted to very high temperature and low atmospheric CO2 and generally dry conditions. And so these constitute the tropical grasses that, that dominate uh, Africa, but particularly East Africa today. They're there because the environment is very harsh. It's, it's dry and seasonally moist, uh, only moist uh, un, uh, un, uh, seasonally, and it's also during low CO2 environments. So how can we reconstruct how vegetation has changed in the past? Well, the first thing that you might say is, well, why don't we just look at pollen? The problem with working with pollen is that Pollen's often not very well preserved in sediments. Any kind of oxygenating environment, depositional environment, the pollen will disappear. And so we have a much more um, elegant way to explore it, which actually ex exploits the way, the, photo, uh, um, the, the biochemical way in which the photosynthesis works using the C4 um, uh, uh, pathway. So this is a brief overview of carbon isotopes. These are the two stable isotopes of carbon. Carbon-14 is the radioactive or unstable isotope of, of carbon. Carbon-12, most of our bodies is, are made up of about 99% of our carbon in our bodies is carbon-12. This is the most common um, uh, atom of, of uh, isotope of carbon. And then carbon-13 is only about 1 in 100, or about 1% of the carbon uh, in the environment. And what we do is we measure the ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12 using a mass spectrometer and then express that ratio as a change relative to a standard using this equation. This is the only equation I'll show uh, for the day. Um, but this, this notation that we'll be talking about. So what we see here is that the C3 versus C4 plant signatures, the grasslands have a much more enriched or more positive C4 uh, carbon isotope value than do C3 plants. C3 plants would be trees and everything else, and C4 plants in the tropics are going to be these savanna grasses. So if we jump forward to a really heroic collaboration that existed with, uh, with Naomi Levin and Terry Serling um, over the past decade or so, they've measured carbon isotope values from soil carbonates, which are these little carbonate nodules that form in soils that record the photosynthetic pathway of the plants that are above them. And so you go to a geologic outcrop, you collect these soil carbonates, and you measure their soil carbonate. And that tells you what the vegetation was at the time of that, that thing that, that it formed. And what you can see is this transition from lower values to higher values, meaning an increase in the grasslands. And this transition is almost about a 50% increase in grass cover. And you can see that the timing of that transition is sometime around somewhere between three and two million years ago. Compare that to this record of the sap repels where you get very rapid cycling between wetter and drier conditions. So this is a secular change. This is a very rapid back and forth, kind of like a pendulum change. So the way that we can now explore uh, uh, past vegetation change is this actually very beautiful forensic tool that was uh, developed, which allows us to look at um, fossils, but these are not megascopic fossils. These are not fossil skulls, they're not fossil shells, they're not fossil paleosol uh, carbonate nodules. These are actually fossil molecules. The molecules derive from plants, from ancient plants. All higher plants have uh, epicuticular waxes, that is, you waxes on the outer surface of the leaves. So if you've seen a rubber plant, that's nothing but wax on the outside. Those waxy mo molecules are very robust. They last for a very long time. And so we can take a, a sediment, we can basically crush it, and then put it in something that looks for all the world like a, an espresso maker, but it has very nasty uh, solvents inside of it. And we'll extract this straw-colored liquid, which is loaded with these plant wax molecules. 
Loaded meaning one in a billion of the carbon molecules in here will be plant waxes. So they're not really loaded, but they're sort of loaded. When we look at them, we can actually measure with a chromatography what the, um, what the compounds are. And when you see this interdigitation between low and high peaks, that just shouts out you. It looks like a hand and it says, I am from a plant. This class of molecules, this class of compounds are all derived from photosynthesis. So what we can do is then we can take each of these peaks and instead of blowing that carbon out into the atmosphere, we then direct it into a mass spectrometer. And we measure the carbon ratio of those compounds. And that's how we can figure out whether that fossil plant that made those leaf waxes was a C3 or a C4 plant. So my student, Sarah Fekins, who's now a tenured professor at USC, did this at, at an ocean drilling program site here in the Gulf of Aden, a place that's very difficult to go to today. And this is the extent of savanna grasses there today. And this is her record, of basically a snapshot record from the site. And you can see it shows that same trend, that same increase in values indicating the emergence of the grasslands. So if we compare her record to Naomi Levin's record, you see they both have this transition, this both this sort of secular transition toward greater grasslands. And what's impressive is that these times, these, these green periods are the same green periods of major events in human evolution. And you can see that these transitions toward an initial expansion in grasslands after about 3, 000, 3 million years ago, and then the, really their establishment at around 2 million years ago um, is coincident with some changes that we're seeing in, in early human evolution. What for me was the biggest, the most exciting discovery in, human, in, in this relationship between climate change and human evolution was what showed up in, in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences um, about a year and a half ago by Turi Serling, but also a number of co-authors contributed to this study. So these are these same records that I showed earlier, this increase in the uh, indicators for grasses sometime after three million, uh, reaching peak values around two million. So this is basically the same figures that I showed earlier. What Turi did and his colleagues, what they did was to measure the carbon isotopes of the tooth enamel in fossil skulls. So they took the teeth and they analyzed the, the carbon isotopes of the teeth and you are what you eat. You would see this relationship. You can see that when you look at early, um, the ancestral humans or ancestral hominins, you can see they're basically tracking the environment. If the environment changes, your chemistry changes. And so the, basically the hominins are just tracking the environment. And you'd say, okay, we're done, right? It's working. I mean, basically, they're just following the environment. And you can also say people could, couldn't care less about the environment because, look, they're just tracking the environment. Watch what happens. The one group that doesn't do that is us. These blue dots are carbon isotopic analyses of early and late members of the genus Homo. And you can see that they are falling away from their other lineage, Paranthropus, which they, they shared the landscape with. So Paranthropus, their diet was mainly derived from grasses, from savanna grasses. Homo, early Homo, got, had a more variable diet. And they were able basically to extract um, a flexible diet from an increasingly inflexible landscape. So more to come soon. This is my postdoc, Kevin Uno. For those of you who want to see um, some truly spectacular new results, I'm happy to talk about that. But really, Rick Potts and Andy Cohen have been leaders because they've led a drilling program up and down the, the, the Rift Valley, collecting more and more and more of these sediment archives. So what I'm showing you is just a teaser for what they're about to, what they're about to do. So thank you very much, Charlie. Uh, today, I'd like to um, present you some thoughts about uh, Neanderthal evolution and to what extent uh, climate may have, uh, might have influenced their evolution. But before I, I start with climate and Neanderthals, I wanted to show you this slide um, presenting a, uh, on the left side a Neanderthal and a modern human, about of the same age. Uh, and in front, you have two skulls of um, um, extant um, apes, a bonobo and a common chimpanzee. And this is just to show you how Neanderthals are different from us in terms of anatomy, in terms of phenotype in general. Uh, modern humans and Neanderthals ancestors 
diverged um, probably about half a million years ago when bonobos and common chimpanzees diverge much uh, earlier, probably somewhere between two and one million years ago. And one of the, I would say, mysteries uh, regarding Neanderthals is what kind of uh, evolutionary processes was driving this very rapid uh, divergence. The way we like to think on the Neanderthals, the way they are presented in the, in the literature, is, is this way. Humans adapted to a glacial environment, a periartic environment. And as a matter of fact, if we have a look on this very jerky uh, climatic curve that you're going to see quite a number of times today, I, I imagine, uh, you can see that for the last half million years, 95% of the time, uh, the, the climate was colder than it is today in the area where Neanderthals live, uh, namely uh, Western Eurasia. This being said, um, the climate was not always glacial. The, the glacial episodes were rather brief, actually. I mean, the most extreme uh, part of these glacial episodes. And if you have a look on, on this map, that's the, the map showing you the distribution of places where Neanderthals has been found, you see that uh, actually they are not documented very, very high in latitude. There is the, the northernmost Neanderthal ever found was found 50 two degrees of northern latitude, uh, which is not so high. And, uh, and Neanderthals lived also in places like Spain and southern Italy and the Levant um, that never witnessed really glacial episodes. And so the question is, uh, what, uh, what in their environment, uh, first of all, drove their distribution and also drove their evolution? Their, the distribution that you see now is, is probably I would say uh, misleading somehow because it's a palimpsest of the distribution of Neanderthals through a very long period of time. So in other words, at a given point in the past, they were never, uh, they had never had this extension. So it's a, a sort of addition of many distribution. And it's very likely that uh, they reach uh, this easternmost uh, extension in the southern Siberia, in the Altai. And this is also true for the Near East for, the, for Southwestern Asia, uh, only at some point in their late evolution. So speaking about climate and the influence of climate on evolution, uh, we have quite a number of <coughs> studies showing how climate can influence the, the biology and the morphology of modern humans. And probably one of the most, would say, spectacular uh, feature uh, that relates to uh, climate in, in extant humans is the, the body shape in general. There is a number of studies showing that uh, the proportions of the, limb, of the limbs, the shape of the trunk uh, varies with climate. Uh, basically, people exposed to very hot climate need to cool their body. Uh, they tend to be uh, slimmer, uh, to have narrow trunks, long limbs. Uh, people exposed to very cold uh, environments, uh, they tend to be more um, askier, uh, more asky, to have shorter limbs, wider trunks. And um, this kind of, of study, it's a, it's a multivariate study taking into account many uh, populations, show you how you can basically rank uh, populations from the tropics. On the, on the right side, you have uh, people from East and West Africa. Up to the higher latitudes, in green, you have European population. So if you take measurements uh, of the, the body shape of a Neanderthal, and you plot it in this kind of chart, and this is the case for uh, one Neanderthal, very known, called La Chapelle aux Saints, it falls beyond any uh, modern European and uh, even beyond modern Inuits. So it's said to be, uh, to have hyperarctic body proportion. Interestingly, if you plot on the same chart, uh, early modern humans who came into Europe about 50,000 years ago to replace Neanderthals, they plot very close to uh, population from modern Sudan, uh, which, by the way, it certainly 
one of the one of the best arguments uh, to make them come out of Africa besides genetical arguments. However, we should be uh, very, I would say, cautious with this, uh, these features because climatic adaptation is not just a biological adaptation in humans, it's also a, a, a cultural adaptation, a technical adaptation. In other words, uh, we suspect that even uh, if Neanderthals were not exposed to always to very cold climate because of the limitation of their technology, the biological response uh, might have been higher than what we have in extant humans. And as a matter of fact, if we look at the archaeological record, we find very few archaeological sites left by Neanderthals in truly periarctic environments. It, it looks like during the coldest phases uh, of uh, the glacial episodes, large portions of Europe has been abandoned by the Neanderthals. There are other features that has been said to be uh, related to climate in Neanderthals, especially their very peculiar facial morphology. They have a very strong mesiofacial prognatism, uh, this very uh, big nose uh, projecting, and on the side of the, of the nasal aperture, inside the face, you have this uh, volumes, which are sinuses, which are uh, said to be very developed in Neanderthals in general. And in a sort of naive way, people have thought for a long time that the development of uh, sinuses in Neanderthals were a sort of um, isolation against, against corn. This, this idea has been very criticized. It's, it's Actually, it's completely abandoned today because we see more these sinuses as a sort of empty space, I would say filling an empty space between other structures uh, that are um, adapting to different functions. It's more interesting to look at, the, at another aspect of the face, which is the nose. And actually, if you look at um, extant humans, you will see that one of the most uh, varying part of the face is the nose and the, the shape of the nasal aperture. Uh, one of these skulls comes from Germany and the other one from Zaire in Africa. And immediately you can see that the shape of the nasal aperture is very different in these two uh, individuals. And there is quite a number of uh, studies showing that actually in humans, the, the, the nose, and especially the inner nose, uh, is adapted to the climatic conditions in different uh, regions. Uh, primarily what we have is a problem with cold and dry air. And uh, individuals, population that are exposed to uh, cold and dry environments tend to have uh, nasal cavities that are higher and narrower in order to increase the turbulence of the, of the air that is inspired and to increase the contacts between the mucosal tissues and this air to, to warm it and to, to, to moist it. And uh, the, the, the nasal uh, pharynx is, seems to be more depending on, on moisture. The nasal cavity itself is uh, cold. So, What's about Neanderthals? Well, at the first look, Neanderthals seems not to match very well this prediction because they have this huge nasal aperture uh, that is somehow unexpected if they were exposed to uh, cold environments. Uh, actually, the, 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 this nasal aperture is especially broad in its upper part, which is not what we find in modern tropical population. But if we look inside the nasal aperture, we see that there are a number of uh, structures uh, that inflate the walls of the nasal aperture in order to narrow this nasal aperture. And uh, although uh, the nasal aperture is, is very broad uh, outside, uh, the cavity inside is, is much narrower and, and, and much the prediction that we can make of a cold adapted uh, population. Last but not least, we have now a number of information coming from uh, paleogenetical studies, and uh, I'm sure there are much more to come in the future, but we know already that uh, there are a couple of features of Neanderthal that we can relate to the climate, the environment, 
And uh, I would like at least to mention uh, this uh, gene called MC1R, which is a, a receptor involved in the red air and, and fair completions. And um, very likely, at least on the Neanderthals on which this uh, gene has been detected, we deal with population with light, uh, light uh, skin uh, color and, um, and, 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 and red air. So we have some adaptation to the uh, cold environment in, uh, in Neanderthals, but the question is, are there other effects of the climate on their evolution? And I would like now to deal with something else that I found probably more important than adaptation itself. One of the questions about Neanderthal evolution is, why do we have this divergence between a, uh, an African lineage leading to us and this Eurasian clade about half a million years ago? What happened at this moment? Why, why then, why not before? It raised the question of when exactly we have the last, the first Neanderthals. And the first Neanderthals we have in the fossil record are about 400,000 years. They are found in England. They are found in the, in the UK, in, uh, in, uh, in Spain. And this, this age, a little bit above 400,000, has been sometime in conflict with the dates that were provided by by geneticists. And geneticists using a molecular clock based on uh, computations, uh, using the, the assumed time of divergence of uh, fossil uh, groups, uh, came to much younger ages for the divergence for uh, Neanderthals and modern humans, more something around 300,000 that was a bit problematic for paleontologists. But recently, because it's now easy to to sequence the complete genome of parents and children. We can compare this genome. And it has been possible to, to find that maybe the, the rate of mutation uh, assumed by this molecular clock was not quite right. And um, new estimates came with a uh, rate of mutation much, much more reduced, about half of what was initially thought. And this new rate of mutation is confirmed by the study of some fossil material. Uh, this is a, a femur of early modern human found in, um, in Western Siberia, for which we have the complete genome. We have the dating, it's 45,000 years old, so it's easy to compare the genome of this early modern human with extant Europeans and to have a notion of the rate of mutation along this lineage, and it confirms uh, this uh, reduced rate of mutation that has been recently proposed. So it means that the, the coalescence time for uh, Neanderthals and, and modern humans fits rather well this emergence in the phenotype, in the morphology, around 400 or 450,000. So what's, what has been going on in, in this time period? We have a list of, of um, features proper to Neanderthal that we see emerging through time by a, a, a process of accretion, called accretion. And it's basically a shift in frequency of these features that we see more and more along time. And uh, about 200,000 years ago in the isotopic stage seven, we have basically reached the Neanderthal morphology completely. So the story unfolds between, say, 450, I'm talking about morphology, huh? and let's say a little bit less than 200,000. And it goes at different speed, uh, depending on different anatomical areas. And we suspect that one of the mechanisms driving this evolution is not adaptation is not selection, but it's something that geneticists call drift. And this drift is mostly uh, depending on demography. So what is it about? It's simple. You have a variability of a population in terms of genes and in terms of morphological features. And if you reduce the size of this population, if you reduce it dramatically, and, and then re-expand this population, you are going to have, again, a large population, but with a reduced variability, just by chance, just because only some of these features went through this uh, bottleneck. 
And we have something like that with Neanderthals and along the Neanderthal uh, lineage. I could go through uh, several features, cranial features, facial features. Uh, I just pick up one example, which is what we call non-metrical dental features. And these non-metrical dental features have a, a frequency that uh, increase along the Neanderthal lineage. Uh, we know they are part of the variability of Neanderthals uh, of the middle places in hominids before the Neanderthal emergence, and they seem to be uh, fixed a little bit by chance in the uh, Neanderthals and reach a very high frequency in later form. So what could drive this evolution? We think this jerky uh, curve that you saw uh, several times already, in this period of time, say around uh, 800 to 400,000 become even more jerky. And we have 600,000 years ago, for the first time, the first major glacial episode uh, in Western Eurasia. And we think that this first uh, major glacial episode resulted in, for the first time, an isolation of uh, Western Eurasia and a dramatic reduction of the population living there. And this is confirmed also now by paleogenetics uh, using the uh, high resolution uh, sequencing of Neanderthal uh, and Denisovan genomes. It's possible to make assumptions on the evolution of the population size through time of these guys. And we see that contrary to what we have in the ancestors of modern humans, we have around five to 600,000 a dramatic reduction of the uh, population size of this group. So the story for this way, we have in the early Pleistocene uh, Western Eurasian hominins with still a lot of exchanges between Southwest Asia, Africa, Central Asia, Western Eurasia. And with the isotopic stage 16, about 600,000 years, we have probably for the first time this separation time that matched the genetical data. Uh, we have another major bottleneck with isotopic stage 12. And soon after, this is when we have for the first time uh, Neanderthal uh, features emerging in the phenotype of uh, European hominins. And let's say 200,000 years later, after a number of other bottlenecks, we have basically fixed this uh, Neanderthal morphology. So to finish, I would just like to say one word about Neanderthal extinction. And uh, I think I, I hope I convince you that climate played a major role in the, in the rise of the Neanderthals. And the question is, did the climate play a role in the fall of the Neanderthals? And uh, there is a number of uh, theories about that, that Neanderthals got uh, extinct naturally before modern humans moved into Europe. What we think about the uh, emergence of modern humans into Europe is a, a scenario that's a bit more complicated today than it was a few years ago. We think we have two major episodes of colonization of Western Eurasia, one uh, corresponding to what we call the initial upper poetics, sometime around maybe 48,000, and the later one for Western Eurasia around uh, 42 to 43,000. It has been argued that in this time period, the, the climatic curve is especially jerky and that that would have driven the Neanderthals to extinction before more, or facilitated the replacement by modern humans. Well, I think when you look at this curve, it's very difficult to uh, see, I would say, more jerkiness in this period than before. I think Neanderthals survived all sorts of climatic changes before modern humans arrive in Western Eurasia. And I think the, the main disaster that Neanderthals had to face was not a climatic disaster. It was us. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there are many fundamental problems in the study of human evolution, an immense array of really uh, intriguing uh, questions, in part because the evolutionary journey has involved an astonishing transformation. 
One way of uh, looking at this uh, transformation is through a pairing of slides. I thought I'd start with the raciest one first, uh, but also the most endangering in some ways. Uh, one way, but it, it poses, this pairing of slides that I'm going to show you poses a question. Uh, and it's how is it that our ancestry included in an imaginative way in this reconstruction uh, dilemmas and survival challenges uh, such as this, and then in our own species that we can present ourselves with a survival challenge like this. How is that kind of transformation even possible? Uh, Ed White's uh, sp spacewalk, uh, the first uh, human to take a, a walk in space. And, uh, how is it if, in fact, evolutionary process tethered our species through change over time, tethered our species to and human uh, possibilities and mentality and society to a particular um, uh, ancestral habitat uh, and to particular conditions of life, how could that transformation have taken place? Another pairing of slides that I think captures this is, uh, can be expressed in this way. Uh, the oldest known stone tool tradition, uh, uh, the, the old one dating back to about 2.6 uh, million years ago. And the question that's posed here is how is our evolutionary, how is it that our evolutionary journey and uh, technology go from something like this to something like this. And as you can read there, this is uh, space debris uh, that is encircling the, uh, the, the Earth. Uh, and uh, as I write there, the entire planet has become an archaeological site. And so in many different ways, our species uh, resides on a human-altered planet. Well, in seeking to understand transformations such as this, we run right up against uh, the fundamental scientific challenge of seeing ourselves as a phenomenon of nature. And I think that sadly, uh, the folk ways in which we see our species uh, often sees and assigns Homo sapiens almost as an aberration of, uh, of, of nature. And the dichotomies, the traditional dichotomies line up uh, in a series of false oppositions, human versus nature, uh, a cultural, versus, uh, versus natural, uh, learning versus instinct, uh, even human versus animal. And it's especially that latter uh, a dichotomy that highlights the false div uh, division that occurs in this particular perspective. Now, human evolution um, is the period um, that we have been looking at so far in these first several talks namely the past six or seven million years of Earth's history, where the baseline adaptations and the initial possibilities of our species uh, emerged in ancestors who are no longer around. And so one way to pursue the question of how the accumulation of adaptations occurred over time is to examine the environmental context uh, of that, uh, that entire time period. And so data like this, which have been shown in the previous two talks and are also, uh, also is shown on the front of your programs, is the oxygen isotope uh, curve um, showing uh, changes and uh, the trends and, and fluctuation in ocean temperature and global ice volume. It's an iconic diagram of uh, paleoclimatology, and it shows that the past six million years corresponding with the period of human evolutionary history have been one of the most uh, dramatic periods of climate oscillation of the Cenozoic era of the past 65 million years. As uh, Peter Domenical showed in uh, his talk, uh, paleoclimate records uh, express uh, at least two signals, the overall trend as well as the variability. And up to about, I would say, 20 years ago, nearly every student in the study of, of human evolution considered the variability as simply noise in the all-important uh, trend toward a cooler and drier Earth. It was the direction of change, the direction of change, the onset of grassland-dominated savannas and in East Africa or in Africa in general, and uh, of ice age conditions in higher latitudes that was thought to be the signal, the signal that elicited the uh, emergence of uniquely human adaptations. 
Yet all of the environmental records also show periods of strong instability, of amplitude variations in as there were switches between arid and, uh, and moist and between cool and warm. Now among uh, many factors that have an influence on, on Earth's climate system, Earth's orbital dynamics certainly are uh, one of them as expressed in, uh, in this, uh, this figure. Uh, we live on a spinning planet whose axis of rotation is tilted, and therefore there are variations, fluctuations, in the amount of solar radiation that hits the Earth at different times of the year and different places on Earth. And so we see these three variables represented here of eccentricity, the shape of the Earth's orbit around uh, the sun, the tilt of the Earth's axis also varies. Eccentricity, the shape of the Earth's orbit, the first factor goes from a more circular orbit to a more oval or elliptical uh, orbit. Um, the tilt of the Earth's uh, axis of rotation varies. And also there is this wobble in the Earth's axis of rotation that uh, relates to uh, precession. Well, when you uh, look at African climate, and really climate all over the globe, but African climate is strongly influenced by variation in solar insulation. And looking at two major, uh, two of those, uh, those variables, it's the interaction of orbital precession, which have cycles of 19,000 and 23,000 years approximately, and eccentricity, the shape of the Earth's orbit around the sun, uh, which has uh, periodicities of about 100,000 years um, and, 400 and about 413,000 years. And you put those four wavy uh, lines together, four basically sine curves together, and the interaction of them shows that there is this interacting, there are these, these alternating phases of high and low climate variability in tropical Africa. And Peter Domenical has been instrumental in, in helping me to under, understand this as we got together in a, in a project a number of, uh, of years ago. And so what we've been able to do, and this is going to come out in the publication soon, um, is that we've been able to label according to very specific um, intervals of changes between the high climate variability times and the low climate variability times of labeling back through time, back over the last five million years, we've been able to do this, um, the highs and the lows, the times of strong instability in, in East African climate, uh, where the amplitude of, of dry and wet were uh, exacerbated, were magnified, versus times of greater stability, the low periods. Um, and uh, what we've been able to show is that the kinds of records that, uh, that Peter has studied, for example, the um, uh, the, the dust records as well as the wet dry cycles that are recorded in the Mediterranean uh, relating to Eastern and Northeast African climate uh, support this alternation and this pattern of division between high and low climate variability. Well, the same uh, paper which will come out later this year um, also explores, well, did the places in East Africa uh, which, um, where early humans lived, where we find fossils and stone tools, do, do those also see fluctuations of this sort? And it turns out in that all of the really prolonged periods of high climate variability, we see also amplification in landscape variability in East African um, sedimentary basins. So for example, this place with the almost unpronounceable name of Alorgasile in Southern Kenya, where I've been working for the last 30 years, um, we see uh, that um, between 350,000 and 50,000 years ago, which was the high, the prolonged high labeled H2 in the previous diagram, that time period that we see the landscape changing in amazing ways of down cutting of the basin and then the basin filling up with sediments uh, compared with earlier in time. And so we think that uh, these are, are climate under climate control, these vast changes in, uh, in landscape, and we see this for all of the other prolonged high variability intervals. Um, well, um, I wondered whether in these prolonged high variability intervals, what happened? Was there anything interesting that happened in human evolutionary history? And you can see the time scale of five million years on the left, uh, and what I've recorded here are the eight, that is the 25% longest periods of high climate variability 
and the numbers that we've assigned them in this paper to come out. And we thought, okay, well, what goes on here? What can we tell from the fossil and archeological record? And it turns out that almost everything that's interesting in African human evolution is concentrated in those periods of high climate variability. FAD, that's a strange word, but it just means first appearance datum where a fossil or an archeological uh, piece of evidence shows us the beginning of a particular lineage in our evolutionary tree or behavior. And so for um, Australopithecus, of all of the major genera uh, in our evolutionary tree, Australopithecus and Homo uh, and Paranthropus are concentrated in a period of high predicted high climate variability, also that of Homo sapiens at the top of the, uh, the chart there. And also the origin of every single major um, technological and behavioral transition in human evolutionary history is focused in one of these prolonged high climate variability intervals. Now, one thing that could be easily criticized about this is that, yeah, but new fossils are found all the time and there are going to be new, new finds that are made. Well, that happened about a month and a half ago with a, a fossil jaw from Ethiopia that repositioned the origin of the genus Homo. Well, it turns out that it repositioned it in the next earliest, in the, in the, in the oldest uh, period of high climate variability. Now, I'm not saying that this is proof, but it's nice to see a robust um, predictive uh, model about this relationship of African human evolutionary history and these periods of high climate variability. We'll see what happens next with the new discoveries. And so we have, uh, we've also seen in our evolutionary tree, we used to, you know, you used to have the march of hominids, you know, going from ape-like to human-like. And that gave a sense of inevitability about uh, the existence of our species on Earth. Well, that idea has been uh, uh, completely discarded. Uh, and we see that we are part of a much more diverse uh, evolutionary tree. And in the context of environmental dynamics, as the conditions of life change with the shifts in landscape and in food and water and shelter, it makes sense that new behavioral possibilities, new adaptations and ways of life we're at a premium if they could allow a greater degree of adjustment uh, in these time periods of very strong uh, variability in the environment. But this also means, this also means, since we're the last biped standing, that other ways of life, prior means of existence, could not be sustained and they were lost. In the light of environmental dynamics, we can also inspect this overview of the adaptive history uh, related to the origin eventually of Homo sapiens. And we can now see these adaptations as the evolution of behavioral flexibility and a wider range, the development of a wider range of adaptive options and being able to switch uh, strategies, essentially adaptability in the face of an unstable world. I don't have time to go through all of these points certainly, but we can point out um, a few of them. So for example, things like um, a simple stone flaking and carrying of food and, and stones across the landscape associated with the genus Homo were ways of being able to buffer the changing menu of food, food distribution and food abundance uh, over, uh, over time during a high variability uh, interval. Uh, the most rapid rate of increase in brain size relative to body size uh, well, the brain is our organ of plasticity, one of our organs of plasticity, and that, that also becomes more understandable, not as something that evolved in a specific narrow set of environmental and survival conditions, but in relationship to changing circumstances. Um, increased cultural diversity and technological in innovation, that of course is a characteristic of our own species and has multiplied the options, the behavioral options. Uh, within, our own, uh, within our own species. Uh, we also see in this chart the foundations for um, a human altered planet. Uh, and for example, the changes in technology, control of fire and building of shelters, um, the, um, uh, even things like the moving of complex moving of resources across the landscape, we can see uh, in the archeological record. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. And so uh, what we see is that we have become very good at surviving by modifying our surroundings and that humans as a result have spread worldwide. Um, and so thus we have global change, global transformation of landscapes and the consumption of resources even 
uh, founded in this early evolutionary history of human beings. Now, my research team uh, has been working toward the top of this time period, about 300,000 years ago, and very quickly. Um, these are some of the things that were occurring in that period, uh, going back to 280,000 years ago. And remember, that's a time period in Africa of prolonged high climate variability. And we see the beginning of, alt of uh, innovations. We see increasing innovation, wider social networks, trade, the beginning of awareness of groups that are distant, far away, um, that you cannot see, and yet you're able to have a sense of values, of valuable rock, like obsidian rock that was traded over long distance. Complex symbolic activity, complex thinking and planning, and I would see this overall as, in an environmental context that we uh, examine now in Africa, a greater capacity to adjust to new environments. I'm not going to show you any more than that, other than to say that our research team is about to extend some of these traits even further back in time, prior to 300,000 uh, years ago. And so what we then come up with is that the new theme and story, in, uh, in the new theme and hallmark of our evolutionary story is one of adaptability, increasing adaptability, to endure, endure change in the environment, to thrive in novel environments, to spread to new habitats, to respond in new ways to the surroundings. And these are characteristics of the genus Homo and especially embodied in us Homo sapiens. Final thoughts, the long-term view of human evolutionary history, the idea of the inevitability of our species has been discarded. It's been, I think, increasingly replaced by an emphasis on adaptability when human evolution is framed within the study of uh, paleo environments. And finally, adaptability, according to the definitions that I just gave, and the demise of ways of life have been two sides of the evolutionary process. And I think the question ahead for us is that this is evolutionary history, but in the cultural history that is now unfolding, will that still be the case? Thank you very much. <laughs>